Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Jackie Nidas, and I'm the CEO for your public library here in Indianapolis. And for the last couple of years, we have been engaged with our good friends at WFYI in a long series of conversations. And so you are part of an ongoing exploration of some very important educational issues uh, with us here this evening. I look around and I'm thinking that probably everybody is still uh, recovering from their Easter dinners and way too much chocolate or something. But um, the important work does need to go on and I want to thank you so much for being here. Your library is um, engaged in a strategic planning process right now and I think you'll see as we go forward that partnerships and uh, discussions and explorations of the challenges facing our city are very much what we want to be engaged in over the next years. And so, as any of you seek uh, see opportunities for that, seek us out. We want to be engaged in these kinds of conversations that'll help us figure out how to get this good city to be a great city. Um, at this point, I'm going to turn the mic over to our good friend, Gail, who's going to give you a little bit more background on how we are all about. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you so much. And I want to extend a thanks to the Indianapolis Public Library on behalf of WFYI. It has been a pleasure for the past two and a half years to host now 18 conversations about education here at Central. We are doing this in partnership as part of the American Graduate Initiative, one focused on helping children to achieve higher levels of academic achievement, and we hope graduate and persist beyond graduation at much higher levels. We hope that tonight's conversation gives you the chance to do three things. We hope that it enables you to get better awareness of what surrounds us in education in this community, that you have a deeper understanding by the time you leave, and we hope you're inspired to take action in some way. And that could be at a local school, it could be with a young child in your life, or it could be in another way. We're grateful that this evening funding from the Richard M. Fairbanks Foundation is enabling us to tape this for web broadcast so that if you have friends who wish that they could be here tonight but couldn't, you'll be able to direct them to WFYI.org. I would also put in a plug at this moment for another conversation about education that we will host on Wednesday night here, same time. Um, this one will be entitled Left Out, bullied, it's more than just hurt feelings. We know that one of the reasons that children are often challenged in schools is because of school climate, and that, that not only is for children, it certainly affects anyone in the workplace too. So we have a panel of experts on ostracism, bullying, neuro-linguistic learning, social-emotional issues, and civil rights who will be here with us that evening. And so we hope that you'll be inspired to join us for that. So we are taping this tonight, as I've told you. Um, Dr. Farabee will give a presentation, Scott, and he will be in dialogue, and there will be the chance for you to ask questions. But because we're taping it, it will be really important that you have a microphone. And so I have um, colleagues here who will be positioned at either end of the aisle, so when it is time for you to be able to ask questions, we just would ask that you move to that point. I'm going to guess that lots of you could project in a heartbeat and we'd be able to hear you, but our mics and our cameras won't be able to hear you. So that would be lovely if you would be willing to do that. So with that, let's do a couple of introductions and, and we'll get rolling in an even better way. I want to first introduce Scott Elliott, um, Editor-in-Chief of Scott, I think I just gave you a whole new job title, didn't I? <laughs> That's all right. King of Chalkbeat, Indiana. How's that one? I go by it also. Yeah, King, <laughs> King Elliott here. So Scott is with Chalkbeat, Indiana. You probably know his writing. He's a veteran education writer, um, been doing that for the past 18 years, and you may know his work um, through the Indianapolis Star as well, where he covered education reform issues. He's also the president of the National <laughs> Education Writers Association, and we're just thrilled that Scott is, is here with us tonight. And then I'd like to introduce Dr. Lewis Fairby. In some ways, I would expect a man who probably doesn't need an introduction in this crowd, but we're thrilled that you're here. This is nearly his seven-month anniversary in Indianapolis, so thank you for being here. Thank you for making this move. And many of you probably know that prior to his move to Indianapolis, he served as chief of staff for Durham Public Schools. In his career, he's been a regional superintendent, he's been an elementary principal, he's had a variety of administrative positions, and he holds degrees in elementary education, 
school administration and educational leadership. As we begin this evening, Dr. Farabee will do some reporting out to you, and then he and Scott will be in conversation. Thank you so much. <laughs> Dr. Farabee? Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, I'm really excited to be before you uh, this evening. Uh, one of the things I always start uh, with when we're having these conversations is a little bit about me and what I'm most proud of. And what I am most proud of is that I am a proud member of the family business. And I want to make sure everybody knows that I had an opportunity uh, to be raised by two educators who are first generation college graduates and only wanted to ensure that all the students that they touch had an opportunity to have a quality education. Uh, much like you, everything that I learned about life and work, I learned from my parents. Uh, my mother would be beaming with joy because she's a retired media specialist. Uh, and so I spent a lot of time in libraries. Uh, and so this is an exciting opportunity for me to be here uh, because this is what I did on Saturdays. Uh, so uh, where she worked, she worked in a small uh, rural school district where there was only one uh, public library. Uh, and she knew that, but her school wasn't close to that area. And so on Saturday mornings, we would go to her school and open up the library for students in the community. And as I got older, I would ask, I said, well, you know, why do we have to do this every Saturday morning? And she said to me one Saturday, and I will never forget this, uh, and it's still with me today, that if I don't do this, who will? If I don't do this, then our students in our school won't have access to book and literature, and if they don't read, and if they can't read, then they won't have those opportunities that they deserve to be successful citizens. And she said that in her own way, but it's something that I've embodied in my work. And we never talked about me becoming an educator, but when I became an educator, both of my parents reminded me to have that commitment, to have that drive, and to stand in the gaps for students who need it more. It is my pleasure and honor to serve as your superintendent, to have opportunity to serve in a capacity where we'll be standing in the gaps together to serve our students. Uh, we need each other more so than ever to provide a quality education for all of our students. And that's my business. And so I want to talk a little bit about how I've spent my time over the first 100 days in the district. And you're absolutely correct. Uh, April 23rd will be seven months in the district. And so I'll talk a little bit about my entry plan. I want to be very thoughtful, very strategic as it relates to my entry in the district and how I was spending my time with my first 100 days. So what I'll recap for you this evening is how I've been spending my time, how I organized the entry plan in that transition period, some of my findings, recent actions, and then strategic efforts that are underway and then next steps. So if you track along, I started with five overarching goals. Uh, these goals drive everything that I'm doing over my transition period, or I should say I'm done over my transition period. First, I wanna make sure that we had an opportunity to have a strong understanding of what our strengths and weaknesses were and build on our strengths and identify growth opportunities. We also wanna make sure that we had an opportunity to identify critical challenges where we needed to improve. I also want to make sure that we leverage resources as we identify our strengths, and I also want to make sure that I establish a presence in the community. These five overarching goals were driven into five objectives, and these five objectives were the drivers for my first 100 days. So you look here, you see that I have five objectives, and they range from relationships with the Board of Commissioners to assessing academics in our district, also communications in the district, and also looking at uh, how we can improve with parent and community engagement. You can see here, with these five objectives, I organized them by milestones. So I had milestones from November to my 100th day on February 28th. And you can see here, I've organized activities 
that are associated with those five objectives that track back to those five overarching goals. I'm proud to report uh, of the 40 activities associated with this plan that I've completed over 90% of those activities. Uh, some have been delayed, but we will continue to move forward to complete those activities. So a little bit about progress that I've achieved thus far, as you can see here, spent a lot of time with conversations with our stakeholders. Want to make sure they had an opportunity to engage our business community, wanted to be sure that we had an opportunity to talk with our uh, higher ed institutions, uh, had phenomenal conversations with uh, universities such as IUPUI, Butler University, uh, Indianapolis University, and Indianapolis is fortunate to have fine higher ed institutions. We needed to connect K-12 with higher ed to ensure that we had a seamless continuum of supporting our students. You can also see, spent a lot of time with our stakeholders, uh, over 10,000 touches with stakeholders, and that started with our students. So I was very strategic in having the opportunity to reprise my role as a teacher. I uh, went into the classroom teaching social studies and history lessons, but also capitalized on the opportunity to make sure that not only did we spend that time talking about uh, what's related to the standards, but also took that time to hear from my students what's going well and how we could improve. In addition to that, spend time with our, our staff members. And so had work sessions and focus groups with teachers, uh, principals. We actually had a virtual meeting as well with all school-based staff. And then we had an opportunity to have town halls uh, throughout the community. And we also had uh, work sessions throughout the community as well. Again, identifying our strengths and opportunities for improvement. So what have we done as it relates to recent action? Well, one of the things that I mentioned earlier, we've intensified our engagement. Uh, one of the things that you'll be excited about this week, we'll have posted on our website, which we recently shared with our Board of Commissioners, is we now have the data back that's been synthesized from our stakeholder survey. Uh, we had over 6,000 participants in our stakeholder survey. And again, this is about finding out what we're doing well and opportunities for improvement. We've also intensified efforts with our Indianapolis Chamber, we finalized our operational analysis, and this information will be used to inform our work as well. And we've also had an opportunity to engage internal and external experts, a part of my transition team, that provided feedback as well. Other recent actions, had an opportunity to spend time working with our Board of Commissioners. As I said earlier, I want to make sure that our governance team was as efficient and as productive as possible. So we provided professional development for our Board of Commissioners. We also had an opportunity to modify our meeting structure to ensure that our meeting time is effective as well. We also had an opportunity to collaborate with local media. Uh, so I had a good time here, with my friend Scott Elliott and others in the media, establishing a rapport. Uh, we wanted to make sure that there was a relationship and a framework for how we would operate and get messages out to the community. This is very important uh, for IPS because one of the things I heard very early on was IPS has image issues. Um, all we hear is about what's not going well. And so we want to be very strategic about how do we engage our local media to ensure that we start pushing out those positive messages, but also enhance transparency and improve community engagement. So some of the findings uh, as it relates to academics, I'll start there. Uh, one of the things that I identified early on as a growth opportunity for us was professional learning. Uh, what we had prof for professional learning was basically a calendar of activities that staff members could participate in if they chose to. Uh, we need a comprehensive professional learning plan that is tied to our strategic priorities. We must have opportunities to develop our staff members. Now, one of the things that I share a lot with audiences is that if you look at business, most businesses spend anywhere from five to 7% on professional development. In education, on average, we spend about 1% or less. So it's really important that we have robust options to develop our teachers so we can refine our craft and we're delivering the best to our students. You also see 
we had a rigid focus on test prep, and then there was misalignment between what was happening in the classroom and what we were getting from our formative assessments. So let me backtrack to the comment on state assessment. So what I was finding is I would go into schools and observe classes. We had a lot of instruction that was geared towards preparing students to be successful on our I-STEP or ECA state assessments. And actually at the high school level, I discovered we actually had a ECA course, an actual course that's named after one of our state assessments. I believe that this is a clear misstep. Uh, if you solely focus on getting proficiency on state assessment, then we're gonna miss an opportunity to truly give our students an experience that's very rigorous and prepares them for a career in college. Um, I-STEP really should be the baseline. Uh, we need to make sure that all of our students are realizing the year's growth annually, and the only way to do that is to push for mastery of our state standards. If our students master our state standards, then we'll be fine on our state assessments. Uh, and, and, and what I also found is that we were defining our success solely by how students were performing on I-STEP and ECA. So I believe we have an opportunity to define success for us, uh, and that may mean beyond the walls of ISTEP and ECA. Uh, but a, a focus just on getting to proficiency, I believe will sell our students short that are already at grade level and beyond. And I also think for those students that are not on grade level, we need to have a clear focus on how they're growing and monitor that growth as well. So as we get our students prepared for state assessments, I believe we have a golden opportunity to capitalize on our formative assessments. And so those are the interim assessments that we give throughout the year that give us indication of where students are with mastering our state standards. I'd like to see us drill deeper here because I believe as we use this information, we can get more students to mastery, but ultimately prepare them for a career in college. Other findings. Uh, central services was a growth opportunity as well. Uh, what I found in central services was that we had opportunities to uh, get leaner. Uh, we had duplication in our roles. Uh, there was redundancy in our workflow. And just quite honestly, we were a district of 130,000 students decades ago. Over time, we've seen decrease in enrollment uh, to 100,000, to 80,000, to 50,000, and now we're a district of 30,000 students. But unfortunately, over time, we had not modified our central service structures on how we support schools. So we have an opportunity to be more efficient here. But also, as we realize efficiencies here, it's an opportunity to redirect resources that were geared towards central services and redirect those resources to the classroom, to our teachers and our educators. We also had other opportunities to be more efficient as it relates to talent gaps. And so we had a challenge of our central services team uh, with talent gaps as it related to how individuals were selected to be a part of our leadership team. Honestly, instead of uh, moving ineffective leaders out at our school level, we actually moved them up. And that created gaps in leadership for us and if we couldn't provide strong leadership, a core leadership, then we saw that our principals struggled and then our schools struggled as well due to a lack of leadership. I firmly believe, and it's well documented, that most people either lead or stay in an organization based on leadership. And so it's critical that we have strong leadership in our central services team, but also strong leadership at the district level as well. Another finding is that we were lacking transparency with our financial status. Uh, very early on, uh, there was a lot of communication in my transition around our budget deficit. So this is an area I wanted to make sure that I studied very well. Uh, and what I discovered is that we had a system of reporting only what we budgeted, but we didn't reconcile what we budgeted against what was actual. And so we have an opportunity here to be more transparent with our financial state, but also it's an opportunity to look at our resources in a different way, again, directing those resources back at the classroom. 
So strategic efforts that are underway. Uh, we're currently engaging our teachers in conversation around modifying our curriculum. Uh, as you well know, we're in the process of approving state standards. Big meeting today uh, with the Department of Ed on our state standards. And as IPS moves forward, it's critical that we have teacher voice in the development of our curriculum documents so teachers have what they need to be effective in the classroom. Also, we wanted to ensure that we establish a comprehensive professional development plan. This is important going back to the conversation about uh, development opportunities. So we want to make sure that we have rich opportunities at the school level, but also opportunities outside of the classroom. Uh, IPS has had a history of relying on primarily external professional development. And so as those developers would come into the district, they would provide those opportunities and then they would leave. And then a lot of the time when those individuals left the district, that expertise left as well. So I believe we will have more sustainable professional development when we capitalize on the expertise that we have within the organization. I believe firmly that we have the talent to do that. And so as we create this comprehensive professional learning system, it will be embedded with leadership from our teachers and others in the district. This opportunity not only to empower teachers, but to teach is also to learn. And so I think this is an opportunity to help all of our educators uh, improve. As we think about how we get better, obviously we want to make sure that we're focused on academics and teaching and learning, but also our graduation rate. And so very early on, I started this initiative of Operation Graduation to ensure that we're tracking the progress of our students that are moving towards graduation, to ensure that they have the number of credits, the courses taken, and the assessments complete to graduate on time. Uh, this is the barometer for every school district. We have a commitment to ensure that when students leave us, they're either enlisted, enrolled, or employed. And to ensure that we're doing that, we have to have systems in place to make sure that students have those prerequisite skills and are able to graduate and leave us and to be successful and productive citizens. But Operation Graduation is also focused on reducing the number of waivers. Um, we have a disproportionate number of students in the past in IPS that have graduated with waivers. And to graduate a waiver, that's a student that has not uh, achieved proficiency on our state assessment. And we believe that it's critical that students have those skills. Other strategic efforts as we were talking about the budget situation, we're now uh, in a process of reporting out on a monthly and quarterly basis reconciliation of what's budgeted and actual to be more transparent. You also see that we are establishing a budget development committee. And this is really exciting because today we launched on our website an opportunity for individuals to express interest in being a part of our budget development process. And this is exciting because this is an opportunity for our stakeholders to be involved in the development of our budget. Uh, our stakeholder voice should be critical as we think about how we will utilize our resources and direct our resources to our strategic priorities. And it's definitely an opportunity to be more strategic. So if you're interested, this is a plug for you. Go on our website, let us know. We're looking for business, community leaders, higher ed, uh, just a number of, of voices will be helpful as we think about our vision for our budget. Next steps, we'll continue to right size the district. That's back to the reorganization and being more efficient with our resources and directing those resources back out to the classroom. We'll continue our work with our academics, uh, being data driven, back to those formative assessments that I mentioned earlier, and ensuring that we're moving to mastery, not just proficiency, but mastery for all of our students. Next steps we have to continue to synthesize the input that we receive. As you can see here, we've heard from a number of stakeholders. Uh, we had the student engagement, focus groups, community meetings, the stakeholder survey. And so we've now in the process of getting all that information back out to you. I'm also in the process of developing an executive summary that would capture my entire experience and would be an addendum to the initial entry plan that was posted on my first week of the job. So you can see I had a very 
uh, fruitful. Uh, and uh, I spent a lot of time with our community over the first 100 days and continue to do so. But now we're in the process of moving towards developing a vision of what we want for our students and IPS. And I'm excited about developing that vision with you. With that said, I'll stop here. I believe we're going to go into uh, some dialogue with Scott Ellie, and I look forward to taking any questions or comments that you might have. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, well, I was glad you did the math for me because I was trying to figure out exactly how long you had been here, and I was going to say about seven months, and uh, that was. Uh, pretty, pretty, pretty close to right, in fact, almost exactly seven months. Seven months this week. And you gave us a lot of sort of nuts and bolts detail there about uh, things that you dug into and found out about the district. But I'm interested in your overall impression of Indianapolis public schools, uh, particularly as compared to other districts that you worked in. I came to Indianapolis from uh, uh, Ohio in 2011, and it was always interesting to me to see what parallels I found that were similar to my experience in the past with other districts I covered and what was really unique here. What were your impressions along those lines about Indiana? Oh, there's, there's so much that's unique with, so Indianapolis or Indiana? Sorry, Indianapolis. Okay, because yes. those are two conversations. <laughs> uh, I mean, Indiana, I have to say that uh, we'd love to have funding for kindergarten. This is the first state I've been in where um, you don't receive full funding for kindergarten, uh, but I applaud the governor's efforts for uh, preschool, but I'd, I'd like to see that happen. Specifically though for Indianapolis, I think what's really unique about Indianapolis, and every superintendent would appreciate this, is that the community understands the importance of K-12 education. Uh, and everyone has been very supportive. Um, but with that support has come a lot of opinions about how things should be done. So the analogy I like to use is, you know, Gray's Anatomy. Just because you watch a couple episodes of Grey's Anatomy doesn't mean that you're an expert surgeon. And uh, we have so many uh, opinions about how the work should be done. You know, everyone's been to school or they've been to school and they have children in school and there's an opinion about what should be done. Um, but I welcome that. Uh, I embrace that interest. Uh, it's exciting to know that we have a community that's very vested in education and particularly important what's a, um, exciting for me is that it's individuals that don't necessarily have children in our school system. Uh, and a lot of people don't realize that there's so many taxpayers, there's so many community members that can help us move forward that may not be directly impacted by our services. Uh, the other thing that's very interesting about Indianapolis is with education, we're very fragmented. Uh, and so we have our townships, we have charters, uh, we have the mayor's portfolio, um, and we all have the same mission, but we're not very connected. And I believe I have an opportunity as superintendent in Indianapolis to connect those dots, pull us together. Uh, collectively, I just think we have more potential than we do individually. Uh, you know, the way I see it, I call it random acts of improvement. So you have pockets of noble acts all throughout the community. But until we come truly connected, we're all in the same boat rowing together. Uh, I think we'll have an opportunity to dramatically transform student outcomes. So I'm excited about leading that effort. So one thing that uh, and you mentioned in your presentation that you've been uh, uh, um, very focused on is trying to tell some of the positive stories of IPS. So tell me, as a district, what is IPS's great strength? Oh, the people. Uh, our greatest strength is the people. Uh, we have. Uh, phenomenal staff members who are very committed. Uh, we have students who come to school every day, want to learn, eager to get to the classroom, many of which leave situations where they're juggling life balls that are just daunting. Uh, and they come, and they come ready to learn. And that's, that's exciting for me, uh, to be a part of a district that has those individuals. Uh, what's also great about um, being superintendent in, in Indianapolis is uh, the business community. Uh, I have been overwhelmed with support uh, for the business community wanting to, to step in and do more. And the philanthropic community, uh, a lot of people don't realize uh, the philanthropic efforts here in Indianapolis are top in the nation as you think about people giving back. And so I'd like to see us uh, 
get to the table where we're capitalizing on those resources and we're better connected because I think if we continue to operate in silos, uh, we'll have philanthropic fatigue uh, because there are only so many resources to go around. And so I'm excited again about connecting us and, and utilizing those resources in a different way. On the flip side, what have you found that, that you found most troubling in terms of a weakness of IPS? Oh, well, we haven't changed a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's interesting. Um, about my second week of the job, I was talking with some individuals who had been a part of the organization for a long period of time. And the, what they would describe is the organization basically looked to date the same as it did 10, 15, 20 years ago. And I think um, our community is starving for a new IPS. Uh, more innovative and progressive IPS. And that's a growth opportunity for us. And I'm excited about uh, being a part of that change. I think our community is excited about being a part of that change. You see it with our marketing and branding. And so um, we're moving in, in a new day for IPS. And so while it's a growth opportunity, I also think it's an opportunity to provide a better service to our students and families. Let's talk for a few minutes about uh, the, the schools of IPS. Um, very quickly, you identified a list of 11 schools that you were very concerned about. These were schools that had been consecutively rated F, and their test scores were flat, or in a couple of ca cases, actually declining. Um, when I've written about those schools in, in my time in Indiana, uh, teachers there, parents there, administrators in the district, a common theme has been to point out how troubled and challenged the uh, children are who come to these schools. So tell me, what are your, what are your thoughts on, on those schools? Are, is there something going wrong in the schools, those 11 schools, or uh, is this simply something that we should expect given the, uh, the challenges that they face? We should expect more. Uh, and unfortunately, you're right, in some cases we've victimized ourselves. Um, I have encountering individuals in our district who have, you know, kind of this woe is me spirit. We have some of the most challenging students. Um, you know, the parents aren't engaged. You know, and, and, and I don't like to look at our work that way. I like to look at our work as the glass being half full. Uh, and quite honestly, in some of those schools that we identified that are part of the 11 priority schools, um, we were just not moving the needle with growth. So I don't buy in completely to the state A through F accountability model um, because you're gonna remain an F until you get to 60% proficiency. But what I like to see if you're under 60% is steady growth. And in many of these schools, we were seeing no growth or we were seeing a decline each year in performance. And that's just not a great environment for students, particularly our students that are most vulnerable. Uh, so we needed to do our work differently there. Uh, we needed to enhance our supports. Um, you know, the analogy I like to use is if you got four children and you buy a large pizza with 16 slices, what's equal is everybody gets four slices. What's equitable may be if one of the older children is 16 and the football player and one's 13 and plays basketball and there's a two-year-old and a one-year-old. Obviously, the middle school and the high school are gonna get more slices. Uh, and we're gonna to have to shift some of our resources where some of our priority schools get more resources to do the work that they need to do. And with those resources come heightened accountability. Can you tell me anything, because we're gonna talk next about the successful schools in IPS, but where, there, where there's been consistent long-term uh, poor performance, um, what do you think we're doing wrong? as a school district in those places. Now you mentioned they may need more resources, um, but there are schools in IPS, which we're gonna talk about in a moment, who are doing very well with very similar kids. So w what is the difference? Uh, well, obviously leadership, as I stated earlier, is, is so vital. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we have leadership challenges in, in some cases. Um, also, uh, we had lots of turnover uh, or long-term subs in a lot of the priority schools and you know, just wasn't able to attract and retain quality teachers in uh, those buildings. Um, and I also think that we've 
diminish uh, teacher creativity in some cases or empowering teachers to do the work they need to do by being too prescriptive in the direction from uh, central services. But ultimately, again, I think it, it tracks back to the leader. And then when you have a quality leader, they can build a team and empower that team to do their work. Let's talk about um, the best examples in IPS. So the school district has 10 A-rated schools by the state. Uh, recently took a look at those for a story I wrote. And it was very interesting to look at um, what makes up those schools. Uh, the presumption, I think, of a lot of people in the community is that the best performing IPS schools are, are exclusively magnet schools, uh, which is not really the case. Uh, I would say, I think it was six or seven of them are magnet schools, but at least three of them, and maybe more depending on how you want to define neighborhood versus magnet, are either actually neighborhood schools or in essence they're neighborhood schools. They might have a magnet theme, but really they're drawing kids from a low income neighborhood very nearby, and they're still being rated in A. Um, what is it that's, that, you know, if, again, if so many people seem to think that challenges are so great in IPS that they can't be overcome, but how are they overcome in those handful of schools where it's not a magnet theme, the children are just as challenged as any other IPS neighborhood school, and yet they're scoring high, growing every year, and rated an A. What are they doing right? Great point. Uh, it, that is a perception, but if you also look at our data, I would say that in Indianapolis, our choice schools still are the schools that are rising to the top as it relates to performance. And that's our charter schools and our magnet schools. Uh, I like to believe that our magnet schools are actually outperforming our charter schools, but our choice environments typically do better. Where we have pockets of success and we need more schools rising to the top would be our neighborhood schools. And our neighborhood schools that are doing really well, uh, typically you'll find a strong leader uh, you will find a curriculum or instructional program that is embodied and embraced by the entire staff. Um, you'll also find a school that has tremendous wraparound services. So typically in those schools, you'll see leaders or staff members who have gone out to the community and garnered community support where not only students are receiving additional supports in the school, but they're also receiving those supports uh, from community organizations during the day or outside the school day. Um, and many of those schools have also mastered the art of extending the school day. So you'll find enrichment activities after school, opportunities for uh, remediation uh, during the day or after school as well. Uh, and you'll see in those schools that they are moving the needle by providing those additional opportunities for students and families. So you touched on an interesting question, which is, whether we need a longer school day, a longer school year, in order to meet the needs of, uh, of some of the most challenged kids in IPS. Uh, I think I've heard you uh, express some interest in that idea in the past. What's your thinking on it right now? Uh, th there's definitely interest, particularly where we have students that are below grade uh, two or more years. Mm -hmm. uh, the research is very clear, especially in literacy. If you're two or more years behind, you need at least 90 uh, to 120 minutes more of instruction compared to those students that are on grade level to get on grade level and surpass those students with uh, ach achievement. And so what we have to do is find uh, creative ways to ensure that students get that time. Unfortunately, a lot of times students get that time by losing out on something else. Uh, and so I'd like to see us explore options where students can get the arts, they can get the physical activity that they need, and still get that remediation time. And sometimes I think that may require us to have a longer day for select students or select schools or a longer year. Uh, the traditional 180 day, six and a half, six and a half hour model uh, is antiquated. Uh, and I think that if you look at many of the charter schools in Indianapolis where they're getting results, you either see a longer day or a longer school year. And I think that's something that we need to explore for IPS. Um, let, let me ask you a question here about, uh, about finances. So uh, one of the biggest stories I think of your early tenure here is your discovery, uh, which you largely led on your, on your own, uh, began with your own research that IPS was not in as bad of a financial shape as we thought. That in fact, what appeared to be a large deficit was a, uh, in fact a small surplus for last year. 
Um, that was an uh, interesting revelation and, and development because I know as, as I was tracking your first six months, I kept looking to the spring and thinking really tough decisions were, were going to be facing you and the school board in terms of how to manage that deficit. Were you going to have to close schools? Were you going to have to do a large number of layoffs? And you were sort of amazingly relieved of that, uh, of that danger. So this is a big opportunity, given that you don't have to face that kind of crisis. Uh, how do you plan to capitalize on that? Well, we still have work to do to right size and be leaner. Uh, and some of the decisions made with that presumption that we had a $30 million structural deficit were probably decisions that need to be made uh, regardless of the findings. Uh, I think we're going to continue to have to get leaner, particularly uh, with central services and other supports to schools to ensure that we can redirect those resources to classroom and also to look at teacher compensation. Uh, and so as we think about, um, you know, getting better and better supporting our teachers, we're going to have to reorganize and get uh, leaner and right size. Uh, as it relates to the budgeted versus actual, some would argue that's a debate of semantics. But I thought that there was widespread perception that many people thought we had a structural deficit. Uh, and I want to be very clear and transparent about our financial state. Uh, it definitely doesn't mean that we're rich. Uh, we still have work to do as it relates to ensuring that we're prepared for the cuts that we realize and are ahead of us as it relates to state and local funding. Uh, we've also have been in a situation where we had declined enrollment over the past decade. And we're fortunate to have flat enrollment at this point, um, but we, we need to continue to be prepared should we have uh, further declines in enrollment. I think this is also a golden opportunity for us to be more strategic about our resources uh, and, and not just be reactive, but be proactive. And it's also an opportunity for us to have a, a model on reserves and, and what we need to ensure that we're able to address payroll or other unforeseen financial needs. At a minimum, it seems to buy you a little bit of time, maybe not a lot of time, but uh, what would have been sort of crunch time decisions which will have to be made immediately. I've heard you a couple times say uh, since this uh, deficit information came out that uh, we can take our time, we can make a plan whether it's for facilities or how we're gonna to work together with charter schools, that this gives you like a year perhaps to create some sort of a master plan? Is that what you're thinking? It does, it gives us time to be more strategic, but it also gives us an opportunity to engage more people in the conversation. So my decision-making model has always been, I've got less time, typically less people are involved in the decision-making process. But here we have ideal time to engage our stakeholders and identifying what the needs are and then aligning resources to those needs. Uh, and so I'm excited about uh, developing a vision for our, our future that's compelling and relevant and aligning the resources to that vision. So one uh, constituency that we're gonna have to talk to is the teachers. Uh, something that's a little different for you probably coming from the South where uh, teachers unions aren't as powerful or as influential is to deal with a different kind of teachers union. Uh, tell me about that challenge. Uh, already they've, they've been a little skeptical of some of your ideas, I guess is a fair way to put it. H how do you think you're going to manage that process? Uh, well, you know, I think every superintendent and um, education association and the bargaining situation um, will have difference of opinions. Um, you know, I think that they have a constituency that they need to support and represent, and I have to ensure that our students get what they need. And so I think sometimes people don't realize that one's adult interest and another is student interest, but I believe that we can find common ground as it relates to ensuring our family and students get what they need. Uh, but we will have to sit down at the table of bargaining to work through uh, issues such as compensation. Um, it's been a while since we've had a significant increase in, in pay in some form. Uh, we've also had a situation where it's costing our employees more for their benefits, which ultimately impacts them at the end of the day as it relates to what they take home. And that's going to be something that we need to look at. Uh, and I look forward to having those discussions. Um, you know, as I said to you earlier, I'm, I'm a, a teacher at heart, and I want to make sure that our teachers are taken care of, but also other staff members as well that support our students. 
And so I'm hoping that we can uh, preserve reserves in such a way that we're preparing for the future, but also at the same time address the compensation needs that we have for our employees. So the one question that I got when I tweeted a request for questions for you was a question about whether there was uh, about to be raises for central office administrators, but not for teachers. Do you want to address yeah, that? Yeah, I'm that glad question? you asked that question. Uh, I got that question earlier today as well. Uh, I think th that some individuals have been monitoring our personnel report and drawing um, misconceptions about what we're actually doing as it relates to um, a hiring process. And so what we've done to be leaner is we've reduced the number of employees in central services significantly. In some divisions, we actually cut personnel in half. A great example would be school and community relations. Um, that was a team of nine. In our new model, it'll be a team of five. Um, uh, so as we are making those reductions, we're asking more from our employees. Uh, the analogy I like to use is the assembly line. Uh, and so if you're preparing camps at the assembly line like we do here in, in Indiana, uh, if you have less people on the line, the product still needs to be made. And so we're asking more individuals that are on the line to assemble those vehicles to ensure that we're able to keep production high. And so what that means for us from our central services, our roles need to be more complex. Uh, the responsibilities are much heavier than what we've had in the past. But also, as I mentioned earlier, it was critical that we have strong leadership in central services. So I want to make sure that we have um, the appropriate compensation to uh, bring in that talent and also be in alignment of the additional responsibilities that we're asking of staff members. And so what I would say to constituents is we've been very strategic in um, producing savings. And so what we've done uh, through this reorganization process is produce almost a uh, million dollars plus in savings just in seven months since I've been here in reorganization. All of that will go back out to the classroom. Uh, so I, I don't really see it as raises. I see it as realignment of the work. And I think it's going to be uh, very beneficial to the future of resources to the classroom and also help us address compensation. Let me ask you a couple questions on this uh, idea of realignment and sort of streamlining the way the district operates. Um, you've said a couple times that you're not wild about middle schools uh, or about middle school students being attached to high schools which has been the model here for several years. Um, what are you thinking about doing there? Are you thinking about moving the district to a K-8 model uh, with the uh, high schools being separate? Yeah, so let's talk middle school. I, I do, I do want to backtrack since you mentioned schools and school supervision. Mm -hmm. I think another good example of the consolidation of roles in central services is we had five individuals that were supervising and directing schools. And our new model will have three. The compensation will be more for those individuals that will be supervising the schools because we're asking them more. Uh, they're supervising more schools and the responsibility is much more complex. But from the consolidation of those roles, we've recouped the savings that again, we can redirect resources back to the classroom and also help address compensation. So back to middle school. Uh, it's very challenging for our families and students because we have multiple configurations of grades for our schools. So we have K-5, K-6, we have 7-8, we have 7-12, we have 6-12. And so what we're seeing in our stakeholder survey feedback and what I heard from constituents through the town halls and our focus groups was there's not clear pipelines for students to matriculate from elementary to secondary. Uh, for example, uh, if I want to go to Christmas Attic's uh, magnet, I've got to leave my K-6 to go there in sixth grade and I'm there from six to 12. If I'm attending a K-8, we really don't have any nine, 12 schools for the students to attend. And so you're asking that eighth grader to transition to a high school where some students have been since the sixth grade if they entered there or some students have been there since seventh grade 
So it's very convoluted for students and families. And I believe we need clearer streams for students to flow through as we think about our K-12 continuum. Uh, and I also think it's very challenging for the few middle grade uh, standalones that we have as a middle school principal. It was very challenging for six, eight. And in some cases with our seven, eights, we got them in one year and we got them out the other year. And that's difficult. As an elementary principal, one of the benefits I enjoyed was having students for multiple years. So I believe we need to create models where we give families options um, that will provide a clearer continuum of K-6, 6-8, and 9-12, where parents can see this is where I'm gonna start, and this is where we're gonna graduate. And right now, I don't think that's really clear for a lot of our families. And honestly, we've done some great configurations based on keeping students in IPS or to address the takeover challenge we had a few years ago. I just don't believe that's the right way to configure. It has to be more strategic and thoughtful for our families. On this question also, um, we, we talked one time about uh, people maybe, maybe don't realize what a small population of high school kids, uh, particularly general high school kids, we have in IPS today because some of our high schools are now independently run thanks to state takeover. And then we have a, a, a chunk of high school kids who are going to magnet schools. Um, if that remaining group is small and we have large high schools, should there perhaps just be one general high school? Uh, we have a couple of large campuses. For instance, Arsenal Tech is an enormous uh, uh, campus and beautiful place. Should the, all the high school, general high school kids be located at one place? We're, we're having those conversations now. Um, you know, grade configuration is one part of the domino but also efficiency is the other side. Yeah, so it's more efficient to have more students on one site, but is that the, is that the best learning environment? It's a question that I think we have to ask ourselves. Uh, what we're finding in the feedback that we receive from our stakeholders, and, and it's very documented as well in, in research, is that smaller learning environments, typically students do better. It costs more, but typically students perform better in smaller learning environments. And so I think those are decisions that we're going to have to grapple with going forward. What's the right grade configuration? What's the right setting for our students? Do we want the massive uh, traditional high school or do we want smaller learning environments? Or do we want to blend between the two? Um, those are discussions that we're having right now. I think what's important for us, though, is to identify what the curriculum needs are and what the academic needs are for our students and create programming for our families around that. Uh, and I think that's important as you think about the conversation we had about middle school is because we're bleeding in middle school and high school. So we start with about 3,500 kindergartners and gradually over time that number gets smaller and smaller and it gets almost to about 1,500 to 1,000 when students get to ninth grade. And so what that tells me and our commissioners that we don't have the right options where we begin to lose students in middle grades, and then we don't have the right options that are attractive for families when students uh, matriculate to high school. And so I am very excited about um, doing our work differently there to retain those students and also give students the options that we believe will help them for career in college. I wanna ask you a quick timely question and then I think we should uh, see if we have any questions from the audience here. Um, I was thinking recently about, uh, well, I was looking at data of some of the schools that were low performers in IPS. And what's interesting is you see so many schools that are low rated today, it wasn't that long ago that they were high rated. You know, there were schools that, that were a pair of A's in 2005, 2006, and there are a pair of F's today. So, you know, sustaining success is a real challenge for IPS, it seems like. So there was a, I noticed as I was covering the state board meeting today, the started education roundtable meeting, that there was a flurry of Twitter comments about uh, Harshman Middle School. So the assistant principal there left a, a, so about a month ago, I think, and apparently the principal has now announced that he's also leaving. This has been a great example of a IPS school that made a remarkable turnaround, has been a good performer for about the last three or four years. How, how do we sustain what's going on there, what's working well? well I think our efforts need to be more uh, grassroots oriented and what we did at Harshman uh, is we took advantage of a school improvement grant that provided a boost of resources for the school. 
Uh, and it's been difficult to sustain that now that we're on the cusp of the funding cliff. Um, I think the other challenge is as you do good work, people look at you as possible candidates for other roles. And so in the case of Harshman, we had two leaders who were doing great work and were tapped to uh, go to other organizations. And so we wish them well, uh, but I think that's a, a call for us to be competitive in our compensation, particularly at our schools that have been struggling where we have turnaround work going. But I also think that it's also a sign that we need to be um, more grassroots in terms of developing and empowering our educators to develop school reform, um, because I believe it's empowered within, it's more sustainable, uh, and we're not relying on booster shots to get towards the outcomes that we're seeking. Um, but I'm very pleased with the work that's taking place at Harshman. I believe that there are strong teachers there that will continue to charge. So I think we have a, a microphone over here. If uh, you would like to ask a question, raise your hand and uh, they'll bring you the mic. So Dr. Farabee, at first I, I just want to thank you for your service. And uh, my whole family is a product of public school. It's been a great experience. Um, but I am worried a little bit about the future. I, I have had the chance to work at Cummins for the last 12 years and I've had a chance to work with some of the world's best engineers. Um, and during that time, I've spent a lot of time overseas and I've seen different regions and countries uh, seemingly on a, on a different trajectory. And I was just curious uh, if you could talk a little bit about what you learned during the assessment on the current state of STEM education and what your thoughts are going forward. Great question. Um, you know, what we have done in education still, I think, represents the traditional liberal arts education. Um, we have not done a lot with meaningful math, science instruction. Uh, and with STEM, we joined the party too late. So much of our STEM education is at the secondary level. Uh, and I believe that's just too late to really create the interest for students to do the work to build those prerequisite skills that are needed uh, for STEM related fields. I see it in my own son, he's a fourth grader. Uh, and whenever I'm able to engage him in hands-on science and um, technology and math experience, his eyes just pop wide open and he's really excited about learning. Uh, I think we're gonna have to move from a model where you learn how to do long division the traditional way you learn your math facts and you didn't really explore the number sense behind how those numbers work. And I think that's where we're going to have to move. Uh, I think you see some of that in Common Core. Uh, I think you see that in other nations where their math book is typically uh, half the size of ours. Um, they're going deeper. And unfortunately, we've had a very wide math curriculum where we just touched the surface. And so hopefully we can go deeper in those concepts uh, and, and prepare students for those fields, uh, particularly our minority and female students where they haven't fared well. And I think we may have to be more intentional in our work there for those students. Uh, but I also like to embrace the arts as part of STEM. So. I've embraced the terminology of STEAM, which is STEM with the arts, uh, because what you find is there is a strong correlation in arts performance with STEM-related fields. Uh, but you know, we, we've done some good work. We have ScienceBound, which is a collaborative with Purdue University that has a clear pipeline for students in STEM. And students are matriculating from IPS into Purdue and faring very well. I think we have an opportunity to replicate those types of programs. Uh, and so stay tuned. We have a couple announcements coming forth where I think you're gonna be really pleased with what we're doing with our curriculum as it relates to STEM. Um, and we also, I can go on and on the STEM, you just have to stop me, but the, the last thing I'd say is, is we have to do more after school and during the summer. Uh, and so when I went to Bankers Field House and saw our students compete in the robotics competition and just see how that's taken off for our IPS students, 
a lot of that work's done after school and on the weekends. And so I think we have an opportunity to do more with enrichment in those areas and then translate it back over to core instruction. Um, but, um, you know, I, I just think we're finding that we're not competitive. And the last thing I'd say is, uh, just truly last thing on STEM, I promise, is that a lot of people believe that because of our manufacturing history, that most of the jobs in manufacturing have dried up, but actually they haven't. They're here, but the skills you need are different. And so we have an opportunity to uh, equip our students with those skills, and I'm just excited about where we're going. I and mean, we can do th more things with coding and helping students learn how to develop software. Um, we're going to open the doors wide open for them to be successful in our future. So I'm, I'm, I'm really excited, as you can tell. <laughs> Other questions? Dr. Kirby, uh, welcome to Indianapolis. I'm a retired Indianapolis public school social studies teacher, high school level. And I'm wondering, um, there doesn't seem to be a lot of effort from bottom up. Uh, there, is there any thought in going to the ju G, uh, juvenile center, jail one, uh, to see where uh, an abnormally large number of IPS kids are ending up? Um, the for, sort of the forgotten. And I realize uh, higher education's fine, pushing them on. What about these kids that uh, are, are being killed at an ungodly rate in our city? Uh, what about the affective nature of education? Uh, where's that? Where, where's going into these communities uh, that are in dire straits, dire trouble, and uh, really bringing education into the community, out to them, not, a, not some general big meeting? So you touched on a lot, and I'll try to address um, all, all of your comments, and, and thank you for your service. You look great. I tell you, when educators retire, they look great. Uh, and so congratulations to you on your service. Uh, let me start with the crime, which troubles me as well. Uh, I think what you find in urban environments when you have uh, low graduation rates or when you're graduating students that don't have the skills to compete in the job market, um, you have a situation where crime is typically elevated. And unfortunately, we have not done our best with ensuring that students have the opportunity to succeed when they leave us. And so I would start there is that we've got to do more to make sure that students have an opportunity um, to support themselves and their families when they leave us. To your point, there's so much involved in that, and you're right, wraparound services are so important. Alternative settings are so important. Uh, career and technical education is so important. And, and I think one of the challenges that we have is that we have uh, created a system where everybody is supposed to go to college to be successful. And we know the numbers that if you have a college education, yes, you have more earning potential. But we also know the number of job opportunities that are available to our students when they leave us with career and technical education certifications or experiences, and most importantly, apprenticeships. And that's something that I'm very interested in, and I think the business community is interested in as well. Um, when I met with our high school students, I was blown away when we started talking about their experiences. I would estimate that 60% or higher of our high school students are working right now to support their family. But they're working in jobs that don't have very rich opportunities beyond the right now. And so we have to find a way to give our students those same opportunities, but give them opportunities to work in areas that are gonna lead to wider uh, career opportunities as it relates to supporting them and their families. And so uh, I, I think apprenticeships will help us with that. Um, you know, giving a, giving a student an opportunity to work in that environment, gain those skills at the same time, gain a little income to support the family is the way to go. And so we have good options, but we can be better. I mean, you can learn how to be a mechanic. You can learn how to be a, a culinary 
uh, professional in IPS. Um, you can learn how to uh, be a, a, a pharmacy uh, technician. Um, but I think we just touched the surface of what we could offer. And um, when I talk with students who are considering leaving us or dropping out or looking at other options, many of them say, I don't fit. And we've got to find a way to ensure that all of our students fit and have a place that, again, when they leave us, they're enlisted, enrolled, or employed. If we can do that well, quality of life improves for everyone. And that's why I'm really excited about the fact that many people recognize that. And I have people who say, hey, my child attends a charter school, or my child's in a township school. I don't have children in IPS, but I want to be involved in helping our students succeed. And together, I believe we can improve quality of life and opportunities for our young people. I've also noticed journalists look very good after they retire as well. Do journalists yeah. look good yeah, after they, they retire? Really okay. yeah. I'd argue that educators, yeah. just something working about young people every day just really helps you. Yeah, I agree. Up here. Dr. Farabee, thank you. Uh, I'm uh, getting ready to be a second generation grandparent through IPS. And so I've had kids come through. And I appreciate your energy and your ideas. One area that often I find gets missed out when we talk about both the successes and the challenges with an IPS is kids with special needs or kids with an IEP. And I'd like you to just talk about your philosophy about that because it's, you know, 15% or more of our kids are identified, some appropriately, some I believe inappropriately as special ed students. And how does that fit into where you'd like to take IPS and those kids? Great comment. Um, that's really important for IPS. So actually that number is more close to 20%. And if you look at Marion County, that's the highest. Uh, and it's something that we're really proud of uh, because we have uh, families who come to IPS specifically because we offer uh, so many options for students that have uh, unique and special needs and exceptionality. Um, with that, though, come some challenges. Um, you know, I think our special education laws are written really well. And we have to ensure that we are truly providing the least restrictive learning environment. And I think some cases, we don't always do that very well. Um, that's training and professional development opportunities for teachers and, and school leaders. Uh, you know, I think it's something that we have to really sit down and plan to get better with. Um, and we also have to ensure that we have better coordination and communication between our special education teachers and our general educators. Um, because a lot of times, if we don't talk well, we don't have an opportunity to truly offer the least restrictive environment. The other area of interest that I want to raise up is autism. Nationally, the numbers on autism are rising significantly daily. Uh, it is a population that we're going to have to find a way to better serve. Uh, IPS, um, I believe, has um, some rich options in K-8, but if you have mild Asperger's or other forms of autism, when it's time for you to go to high school, we really don't put our arms around you very well. And I think we miss an opportunity to prepare those individuals to go to high school and be prepared for a career in college. And, and so, you know, we've, we've got to figure out how do we do that better. Uh, there's research being produced on a daily basis on uh, learning more about how to better serve uh, students with autism, and that's something that I'd like to see IPS be a trailblazer with um, because, it, again, it is the fastest growing uh, special education population in our nation. And if we don't get ahead of the curve, I think we're going to um, be in a situation where we're not serving the students who are most vulnerable or have very unique needs. Um, I also believe that uh, we have learned a lot on our job training. And so we provide students with 
very uh, specific and unique opportunities that relates to job training uh, if there's special needs. But I believe that we can do more as well. Uh, if we can give students the skills uh, for jobs right now and, and begin to prepare them to be familiar and be acclimated to the work environment in a meaningful way, then I think we can help them uh, be successful along with gaining those life skills that they need. And finally, um, parent support is so important with special education. Because oftentimes as a teacher and a school leader, as you talk with parents with special needs, oftentimes the perception is, I'm the only parent in that situation. And you get that from general education as well. Uh, but it's so important, I think, to connect our parents with students with special needs to ensure that they have a parental support net so they're not in that situation alone. Um, and because I think a lot of parents in that situation are, uh, are struggling or feel like they're alone because they feel like they only uh, have a household with, with students or a child that has special needs. And, and there's many more across our district. And so I'd like to see us better connect those families in a more meaningful way. Other questions? Right there and then here. Oh, sorry. There's one over here. We'll come back to you. Are we here? Where are we? Yes. Okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. Uh, I was speaking to a student yesterday, not an IPS student, but a local student here in Indianapolis who'd been expelled for a year for touching a gun that came to school. Didn't bring a gun, uh, but it was moved from one student to the next. I was wondering, so expelled for a year and also several weeks in juvenile detention and still a ankle bracelet on. Um, I was curious what your experiences have been so far since you've been to Indianapolis about guns in schools and what you think the appropriate response to a student that would be in a similar situation would be. Um, what's your reaction to a month of expulsion? No, 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 no. a year, a year, a year of expulsion. Right. So I think every school and every school district struggles with the balance between safety and academics. So you want to make sure that you have a safe learning environment, but at the same time, you don't want to compromise safety in such a way where other students may be in danger. And so anytime uh, there's an opportunity to have a gun on campus, obviously you're compromising safety. But at the same time, if you're removing a student from the educational environment for a year, that's a year that that student doesn't have access to instruction and he or she is getting further behind. And so we're constantly working to ensure that we strike a balance between preserving the learning environment with, with, with safety, but also ensuring that we're very thoughtful about how students or when students should be removed from the traditional learning environment or how they should be placed in our alternative setting. Uh, I, I'll tell you one thing that concerns me is that if you look carefully at the number of recommendations we have for long-term suspensions or expulsion, uh, close to 100% of those recommendations are being approved. Um, and that's something that we're studying and we're looking to uh, re-engineer that process um, because I think a system that ultimately produces 100% of approved recommendations for long-term suspensions and expulsion is a system that is broken. I also think we have an opportunity to change the face of our alternative setting. Um, they shouldn't be perceived as the dumping grounds and they really should be truly alternative settings for students who need unique educational settings. And we're in the process now of uh, redesigning what those experiences will look like and developing those experiences that they are truly alternative to our traditional setting and not uh, dumping grounds for administrators where they feel like students shouldn't be a part of the traditional setting. We're also working more closely with our judges uh, 
uh, and uh, our judicial officials here in the city to ensure that we are in uh, better communications in regards to better supporting our young people, uh, where they're not falling through the cracks, and also enhancing the communication between other educational providers. So because we're so fragmented, in Indianapolis we have students that pop in and out of IPS and charters or other schools that we often lose our most troubled teens and we're not able to truly put our arms around them. And so I'm excited about the direction that we're going forward as relates to having better communication, particularly for students that have been uh, involved in our judicial system or have um, criminal histories. If I could just quickly add to that one and then we're gonna go to your question. Um, what, as you redesign that system, do you think there's an opportunity there to address this, uh, this uh, recent national news about the disparity in the way that uh, children are uh, disciplined? In particular, uh, there seems to be more and more severe discipline nationally for African American children. Is that part of how you, uh, is that something you may be able to address in that? Absolutely. And so um, we really haven't done a great job with collecting that data. And we're now starting to make sure that principals have that data in front of them and asking them the hard questions about suspensions um, and ensuring that we have positive behavior interventions in all of our schools to ensure that our mode of discipline is not just reactive, but it's actually one that's proactive. Question right there, and I think she has one here as well. Go ahead. Dr. Kirby, thank you for being here. Thank you. I am. Um, I'm, an, I'm a, a uh, businessman here in Marion County. I'm a lawyer. I've been here for over 30 years. I live uh, in an IPS school district. And unfortunately, the sad reality of the perception in Marion County in terms of the strategic thinking that so many residents have taken for the past several years is they leave because of the IPS school system. They don't want to send their kids <coughs> to IPS. I look forward to the day when, and I believe it can happen, I can see it, that it can happen, when people are coming back here because of the school district, because of IPS. It would almost be unheard of, I think, for people. I, I've never heard anyone say that. I'm moving, I'm moving into central Indianapolis because I want to send my kids to IPS. There are not many people I've heard say that. And what I ask you is, what is it that the business community, the professional services community, can do to help this turn around? Because I believe as IPS goes, so goes the city of Indianapolis. Completely agree with you. And so you're echoing what I said earlier, which what is what every superintendent wants is a business community that says, I want to do more. And I think what the business community has realized is that even though IPS is a fraction of the educational providers here in Indianapolis, they're the face of Indianapolis education. So when people think about Indianapolis as businesses may want to come, as people are encouraging families to find a place to live or economic development, the first source they go to is IPS. They don't look at the mayor's portfolio. They don't look at other charters. They look at IPS. And so what we have to do is start dedicating our uh, collaborative efforts to enhancing that conversation around all of the providers and ensuring that IPS has a strong state in the supports. Um, you know, I, every day I, I read something about how people are investing in all the other providers. Um, I think recently, I think $11 million went into developing uh, one of the Crystal House charters. But unfortunately, when businesses think about economic development for Indianapolis, they're not thinking about Crystal House, they're thinking about IPS. So we've got to find a way to invest in IPS in a more meaningful way, because ultimately we're not going to get there on a dime, and we know that. 
but we also have an opportunity now to work collaboratively to ensure that our young people see our businesses as an opportunity for employment, but also an opportunity uh, to see uh, how IPS and Indianapolis professionals are, are working and sewing into our community on a daily basis. And so I love to see business leaders in our schools, principal for a day. I love to see uh, an alliance of businesses coming together saying we've adopted IPS. Uh, I love to see our business leaders helping us design our curriculum, helping our teachers have a better understanding of how to move from just theory to application of what our students are gonna potentially need as it relates to skills when they go into the workforce. Um, this idea of we just do what we do and you just do what you do, and that we're gonna just produce these students that are prepared for this work environment is a myth that we need to dispel. We have to be connected to ensure that what we do on this side prepares students for what happens on this side. And so I welcome and embrace um, the business community and I look forward to enhanced relation. And not all of that is just on the business community. Honestly, IPS has had some closed doors as it relates to collaboration with the business community. And in this administration, the doors are wide open and the opportunity are wider than what they've ever been. And I look forward to capitalizing on these new opportunities to forge relationships. Uh, and when we approach the business community, we won't just have our hands out asking for a check. We'll have our hands out uh, in such a way that we're asking you to be a part of how we get better and to capitalize on your expertise and resources. I think we have a question over here from the lady in the Arsenal Tech Championship basketball t-shirt. Yes, you Titans, might, a you great might like story. To, uh, and, and I have to say this, because Scott did a great job with telling this story too. And I tell it wherever I go when we talk about the Titans, is that not only are they exceptional young men on the court, but they are exceptional young men in the classroom. They have a cumulative GPA of 3.2. Our star player is the top of his class and almost everyone has earned a scholarship uh, to a division one school and you know the requirements there academically. Uh, they're fine young men, actually one of them was the volunteer coach for my son's basketball team. That's the type of young men that we had on the court and that's the type of young men that we have in our classroom in our community. So I'm glad their story is being told throughout our community. So, so, so glad, glad you're here and glad you wore the shirt today. And now I have a lump in my throat. <laughs> my son was a manager of the basketball team and he knows all of those young men. Several of them are also in New Tech Academy, which he is a member of New Tech Academy at Arsenal Tech and um, it's been a privilege and I love telling people around the community that you know these guys aren't just fantastic basketball players they are wonderful young men and all of them are good students so it's it's a really wonderful story to share. And they all have handled well the challenges of their home life and you know, I just want to make sure that we don't lose sight of all the life balls that the students in IPS are, are juggling. I'm, I'm gonna let you ask your question, but I'll make sure <laughs> I hit this point. And I, I think we all have, and that's for the business community, community leaders, higher ed, it's easy for us to be targeted because of our student population. And I don't make excuses for our students when I say that. But I think a lot of times people come out of us because we are easy target because of the student population that we serve. I don't ever want us to lose sight of all the balls that our students are juggling, of where my parents are gonna be when I get home. What's the financial situation like in my house? Where my next meal is coming from? Uh, how can I support my family? Again, back to all the students having the opportunity to, 
to work and earn income. And I don't think it's always fair when we compare our students to other students who aren't balancing as many balls. And so not only are these students exceptional in the classroom or court, they're juggling more balls than the students that they're competing against. And they did it with class and dignity. And I think that's phenomenal. And so, I, again, I just can brag about them all day. So I give you opportunity to ask your question now. <laughs> Thank you. I'm here admittedly for selfish reasons as well to hear your uh, vision and, and see your, uh, some of your plans for the district. Um, I wanted to ask you specifically or to have you expound a little more on waivers. Um, this gentleman and then you added to many things that are going on in our household. We are at IPS. My son is an Arsenal Tech senior because we were not served. He was not served by the township school corporation where we lived. And um, it's been a wonderful thing. Even if IPS does not embrace high school special ed students as well as the younger grades, uh, we are light years ahead of where we were in our township. Mm -hmm. So the question of waivers. My son has autism. He is diagnosed autistic, not Asperger's, but very high functioning. Um, carries a very good grade point average, and um, he also has dyslexia. And he has not yet passed the English portion of the ECA, which he will be retaking for the fifth time in May. And my question, I, I don't know that I really have a specific question other than to say, can my son have a waiver? My question really is, and, and I understand there's a process, but you know, it's an educational environment and there are teachers and there's a lot of rumors <laughs> about, we're not getting waivers, we are getting waivers, no one, you know, uh, only this many per school. Can you just give me a little more Let, information about the waiver process and um, how that may work, you know, for my family in a, in a month or so? I'm glad you asked that, and thank you for allowing us to to serve your children. Um, you know, you're not alone. I, I I would love to tell you the stories of all the families I talk to, the the parents that drive from Carmel to our schools every day because of what we provide. I'm glad you are raising the concern around autism, uh, which echoes my comments earlier. Uh, that's just something I believe we've got to get right. Uh, but as it relates to the waivers, uh, we truly wanna make sure that our waivers are open to the students that are in those unique situations where they're taking the ECAs multiple times, they're coming to school every day, uh, they're giving their best effort, but that's just one hurdle that they haven't been able to overcome. Um, I think that's the true intent of the waiver, but I believe that it was abused in some cases, and it was a get out of jail free card for some students who could have done more. And so we legally, are um, required to offer that waiver and we'll continue to do so. But what we will do is have a stronger filter to ensure that it's not a get out of jail free card for students, it's not a get out of jail free card for teachers, but that we truly make sure that we do our best for students to be successful on our state assessments. But at the same time, we're still very mindful that not all of our students are going to be successful and are still giving their best and that opportunity will still be available to those students. So I would say to your son, keep doing what you're doing and if you continue to give us your best, we'll make sure that um, you have access to the waiver and access to graduate from IPS. Uh, but it's just something that we needed to get a better handle on 
Um, two years ago, we had close to 200 students that were graduating with a waiver. This fine young man did a great um, series on waivers, and it, it just got to a point of abuse, and we're getting a better handle on that. But hopefully that gives better clarification on where we are with the waiver. I can tell you the waiver data was very interesting this year, especially for IPS. Uh, so I wrote a story two years ago about the high use of waivers in Indiana. Uh, came from here from Ohio, which has very similar rules with regard to waivers. And about 1% of kids, less than 1% of kids in Ohio use a waiver to graduate. The number here two years ago was 9%. And I just thought it was very out of line. And when I looked at IPS, um, they were giving the waiver out to about one in five graduates, which is a very high percentage. So what we've seen in, in the two years since I wrote that story is the, uh, the, in IPS, the use of waivers has been cut in about half. And this year, for the first time in four years, we actually saw the percentage of graduates in the state who used waivers uh, decline. It had been growing, growing, growing. It went from 9% to 6.8, which is a pretty significant decline. Um, and I think a lot of that was driven by IPS and some of the other uh, large users who I think uh, reassessed how they were doing things. So it was a really, uh, and uh, I should also mention that IPS managed to drive down its waiver use while also driving up its uh, graduation rate, which is not a very easy thing to do. So that was very interesting numbers. Are we finished? All right, here's Gail. Thank you very much, Dr. Ferry. Well, thank you very much. I want to thank all of you for being here this evening and being part of this conversation about education. Dr. Ferry, thank you. Thank you for very having much. Me. We're very grateful. And Scott, as always, thank you. Do you know, when we started tonight, we said we hoped you walked away with some greater awareness, perhaps some deeper understanding, and for sure a way that you might be able to take action. I hope you've um, been able to latch on to at least one of those outcomes this evening. Thank you very much for being here. We do hope that some of you and, and will come back Wednesday night when we talk about school climate, about bullying, ostracism, the legal rights of students and workers in those settings and ways that we can do better on behalf of children and youth in this state. So thank you very much for joining us tonight.